Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, good morning, and let me welcome everyone to today's hearing. Uh, first, I'd like to give a shout out to some of my colleagues, uh, Ms. Pingree, Ms. McCollum, and uh, Congressman DeLauro for suggesting the topic for our hearing this morning. I'm delighted that we are having the hearing. Uh, today's topic is sustainable agriculture, uh, specifically uh, the economic opportunities for farmers uh, through such sustainable agricultural practices. Uh, to be sure, farmers uh, have known for a long time that implementing simple practices such as crop rotation and no-till uh, can increase both soil health and the bottom line. Uh, uh, but there's a renewed focus more broadly now on sustainability, and rightly so. Our farmers, consumers, and industry are more conscious than ever about how their actions will impact air quality, water quality, soil health, and animal life. Uh, consumers want to know where their food comes from, and they are increasingly drawn to products that are produced in a sustainable manner. Uh, that's why I'm very excited about our witnesses and the discussions that we are about to have this morning. Uh, agriculture is a leader when it comes to sustainability and conservation, and it deserves public recognition for what it has done and what it is doing in this area. Uh, more of a sustainable practices can reduce the impact of natural disasters, uh, and unfortunately, as we've seen too often over the past several years, droughts and flooding uh, have cost farmers billions of dollars, improved sustainability, and help reduce those negative impacts. Uh, this is an exciting time for agriculture. New technology, research, uh, allows farmers to make more precise and cost-effective business decisions. Uh, they can increase yield while at the same time decreasing waste. I think everyone can agree that it's a win-win. And that's what we want to convey today. Agriculture is doing its part. One of the bigger challenges for farmers is just understanding all of the tools that are available to them. We discussed this yesterday with Secretary Perdue, as a matter of fact, and I hope we can explore that today here as well. Uh, our panel includes Jason Weller, uh, a senior director for the Land Lake Sustain Program, Pleased to note for some colleagues who have been on the subcommittee as long as I have that Jason worked for the subcommittee uh, and then went to USDA and ultimately became the chief of NRCS. Welcome back, uh, Mr. Weller. Uh, we also have Nate Powell Palm. Uh, Nate is a young farmer from Montana who's taken sustainability to heart and he shows what's possible with a little hard work. Let me rephrase that and say a lot of hard work. <laughs> Finally, uh, Acting uh, Associate Chief Kevin Norton of the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, he's here to fill out the picture of federal resources that can help farmers uh, undertake sustainable practices and to share his years of experience on the ground at NRCS with us. Uh, so uh, I would I will defer uh, the comments from my ranking member, Mr. Fortenberry, uh, uh, till he, uh, his arrival. Uh, but with that, uh, I'd like to recognize our distinguished guests for brief oral statements, and then we'll proceed with questions. And without objection, the entire written uh, testimonies will be included in the record. So please proceed in any order that you wish. You can go left or right. You can go, Mr. Weller. It does not matter. Uh, so if you would, uh, we'll start with Mr. Palm. Uh, let me, should I say Powell Palm or Palm? Powell, Powell Palm, please. Okay, Mr. Powell Palm. Thank you, Chairman Bishop, and uh, thank you, Member Fortenberry, when he is here, um, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. 
My name's Nate Palpalm, and I'm a first-generation uh, grain farmer and cattle producer from Belgrade, Montana. Um, on my farm, Cold Springs Organics, I raise just about 875 acres of Durham wheat, yellow peas, grass hay, alfalfa hay, and cattle. I got my start in agriculture when I was nine, when my uh, parents let me purchase a um, steer to raise and take to the Gallatin County Fair. Um, my parents themselves aren't farmers by profession, but certainly by heart. Um, from that experience with the 4-H calf, I became determined to get into the cattle business. Um, I, when I was about 12 years old, I applied for and was awarded a junior agriculture loan from the Montana Department of Agriculture for $3,400 to purchase three bred cows, um, a little bit of fencing, feed, and a stock trailer to haul them around in. Um, after three calf crops, um, my whole small herd was growing. I was really enthusiastic. Um, however, my bank account was not growing. And so in 2006, I became acquainted with certified organic agriculture. Um, I purchased uh, some certified organic hay from a few really pioneering farmers in Helena, Montana. And over the next two years, I learned about this world where farmers actually request to be certified and inspected. And they are really interested in having the excellence of their farming practices recognized. And, um, and to sell into a market where sub demand is outstripping supply. Folks are really interested in purchasing and paying a premium for the crops that certified organic farmers are growing. So in 2008, I applied for and received organic certification, and I just had my 11th annual organic inspection. Um, after my first organic inspection, I quickly joined the Montana Organic Producers Co-op, which is a 22-member um, market, uh, regional marketing organization for grass-fed certified organic beef. And after joining it, I was able to realize about a 30% premium on my calves and finished animals. And because of that premium and that stability in the market, um, I was confident that I could go out and start expanding my operation um, and thinking about leasing more land and possibly hiring someone. Shortly after my junior year of uh, college, I sent out 90 cold call letters um, trying to tell local landowners that if they would lease to me, I would get their farm certified organic, I would be able to pay them above market rates, and I'd be able to start a process of building soil on their ground. And I think that uh, I got about 10 letters back and they were all really excited about the prospect of working with me. And so that's ultimately how I came to lease about 875 acres in the Gallatin Valley in Montana. By 2017, I had 240 acres in a grain rotation along with the balance in hay and pasture. And while I had good markets for the wheat, I knew I could really improve my soil and my crop rotation if I could be raising and selling legumes, including yellow peas, garbanzo beans, lentils. But I just needed to find a customer, a contract customer. So in 2016, I joined the Organic Trade Association, and during their annual fly-in, several farmers um, were invited to sit in on the Grain Council panel, and at this meeting, we really tried to express to grain buyers, large institutional grain buyers, that the uh, folks who are buying grain really need to buy an entire rotation, not just wheat or not just one crop, because in order to diversify our farms, we need to be able to sell those respective crops. Um, and so in that meeting, there was a representative from Annie's Mac and Cheese, which is a subsidiary of General Mills, and the folks at Annie's reached out to me and said they wanted to reimagine their traditional pasta products by incorporating yellow peas into their rotation. And so by doing so and working with me, they would give me a market for my yellow peas and just a brief history on yellow peas and why they're so fantastic. They fix nitrogen, which is the biggest fertility input that farmers have. And so by fixing nitrogen, I'm getting paid to grow my own fertilizer. They're also going to purchase my Durham wheat, and then they're going to make this protein-packed certified organic product um, that is you know, a, a something that consumers are really interested in purchasing. So the first batch of this pasta here <laughs> hit the shelves um, in the spring of 2018, and we have our second edition of single origin pasta coming out, um, incorporating more farmers and more rotations from Montana. Um, and so when farmers can receive a premium in the market for sustainable practices, it's a win-win. 
I chose organic to do that, and everything I've just shared with you is possible because of the trust consumers placed in the organic seal. It's this transparent, rigorous certification process that allows farmers to be economically compensated for clearly defined land stewardship practices. In order for this opportunity to stay available to farmers like myself, USDA must accommodate and be accountable to advancing organic standards and to emphasize continuous improvement in organic public-private partnership. And I hope others have the availability and this opportunity stays available to farmers in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powell Palm. Um, Mr. Weller. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Fortenberry, members of the committee. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, Mr. Powell Palm, uh, drop mic. I think what you just summarized really <laughs> the sustainability journey uh, that in part we're trying to advocate for that my former colleague, I continued colleague, um, Mr. Norton and I have been uh, friends and peers for a long time, and we've been in the space of, of sustainable agriculture through USDA. Um, let me talk a little bit, back up a little bit, um, and first uh, talk about my pride in terms of public service and having served, of course, this committee, but also in other federal offices, but of course, really proud of my time in, in being a colleague of, of Kevin Norton and the NRCS team at USDA, um, but also equally proud of my time now working for a farmer cooperative. And so I joined the Land Lakes team about two years ago, and in part working for a co-op, having this, this di discipline, but also responsibility to work for America's farmers and for members of our cooperative system to help them be successful. And that's really then a shared vision between USDA and ultimately our cooperative owners and our cooperative system, is how do we help farmers like Mr. Powell Palm be economically successful, but also not just be successful one year, it's really for year over year, multiple seasons, multiple crops, if not multiple generations. And so it's that ultimately, that's what we aspire to do through Land Lakes, but also through USDA. And how do we help ensure the economic and profitable, profitability success of producers like Mr. Powell Palm, but also ensure the vitality, the productive capacity of our environment, our soils, and our waters to grow for generations to come. So it, it, none of this is possible, and in part, I just want to also then commend the committee for its leadership and talk briefly about how the programs that you all oversee and invest in truly is an investment in the public trust, in this case, providing for the foundation upon which the science, the conservation programs, the practices, the delivery infrastructure, to take all this expertise out in the field and allow for producers like Mr. Powell Palm to be successful, and so it, it just, it more than ever now seeing it from the private sector and seeing it from where I work with the cooperative system hat, um, you have to have a place like USDA and in particular an organization like NRCS. It is the only thing like it on earth. It is a special place that employs visionaries and leaders. People like uh, Gilbert Borrego from New Mexico, Tim Griffiths from Montana, Dr. Dave Noggle from Montana, um, Jane Hardesty from Indiana, Leonard Jordan from Georgia. Um, there are leaders and visionaries across this organization who toil and work day in and day out to provide service to the public, but also crucially to service to the farmers. And it's upon their shoulders, upon now which we stand. And much like how in other sectors where the public has invested in science, that return on investment not only creates an internet or creates an aerospace industry, it also creates a really successful and vibrant agriculture sector. So coming to Land O'Lakes, the Land O'Lakes story, we are a 98-year-old farmer co-op. We started in St. Paul, Minnesota 98 years ago as a dairy creamery. And this cooperative system approach where farmers are coming together to co-invest for their shared benefit, to invest in innovation, but also then in shared uh, support for each other is really the cooperative way. And so I'm really proud to be now working for a Land O'Lakes cooperative system where we now I represent and proud to be here talking for and speaking on behalf of 3,700 owners across the whole system, they include dairy operators, row crop farmers, local and regional farmer cooperatives, and independent ag retailers collectively coming together. And Land O'Lakes as a board having the vision then create now the unit I work for, this team called Land O'Lakes Sustain, where it's our goal is to help our cooperative system build up the capacity and expertise to work in partnership with NRCS but then also to be able to then work directly with growers like Mr. Powell Palm across the United States to help them identify conservation opportunities on their lands 
in this case, conservation being in balance, the balance being profitability and ensuring they're successful for this crop season, but also always having that stewardship hat on and ensuring the long-term capacity of their fields to be productive year over year. And so excited for today's hearing. This is a really important topic, and that is about our future ability not just to feed ourselves but the world, but always holding in balance this ability to, for, to address changing weather, extreme conditions, but ultimately helping that family farmer be successful and stay in the land and be able to pass that asset and that land and that rural community, keeping that intact and allowing it to be passed on to future generations. So thank you very much for today's hearing. I look forward to the conversation. Mr. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Fortenberry and the subcommittee members. It's uh, uh, I really do want to take this time to express our appreciation to you for your continued support of the uh, conservation programs that Jason spoke about. In fact, I'm, I'm really having trouble getting my thoughts together after uh, the inspirational uh, message that he had around our partnership with agriculture producers. And, uh, and, and it really is a, a lot of what I wanted to talk about with you all today. It's a great honor and opportunity to be here with you. As the Natural Resources Conservation Service, we were born out of the Dust Bowl 70 years ago, uh, uh, or over 80 years ago, a, uh, a terrible environmental uh, disaster uh, that uh, brought birth to our agency, and we have moved forward hand in hand with agriculture producers ever since. Uh, our model is uh, trained conservationists on the farm with the individual producer, working with their land resources. Their, their business model is their model. It's different from one farm to the next. Their capacity to accept change is something that they have to deal with themselves, and it takes a professional conservationist working with them on their farm to make that happen. It's a model that's worked well. Uh, it's, it's a partnership. Number one, our number one partner, and we'll talk more about partners, but our number one partner is that private landowner. 70% of the United States of America is under private ownership in agriculture production. And they are the person that we need to be working with if we're going to make meaningful change and support to the agriculture community. Uh, it's an effective model, as I said earlier. Our farmers, ranchers, forest landowners, they're on the front lines of weather volatility. As uh, Jason mentioned, uh, we had fires uh, in the west, in central plains. We've had, uh, just as recent as a month ago, uh, the bomb cyclone. Uh, those farmers, those ranchers, those forest landowners feel the effects of those. Our conservation programs actually uh, create a buffer to a certain extent to those kinds of events does not solve them. But if we can help minimize the risk, then they have a greater opportunity to be successful on the other side of this event with all the other support that might come their way uh, through the agriculture community. We're in the community. We have 2,100 offices scattered across the country. We have uh, those individuals are living in those communities. They're a part of that community. Uh, our employees feel the same things those farmers are feeling as they're uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, the events of, of weather, of the climate, of, uh, of the changes in the markets. Uh, they're right there in those communities with them, so they understand, and it's a great model that we have. Uh, we work with producers large and small. Uh, whether it's a small producer just getting started, that's growing his operation, as we've heard uh, from Nate, there's folks out there that are just like that. We work with them. We work in the urban agriculture space. Uh, we do hoop houses. We work in these, uh, in these food deserts to help uh, create opportunities. In my home state of Louisiana, uh, we have a, a visible presence in New Orleans uh, and uh, have helped uh, stand up a farmer's market there through the USDA programs and wonderful produce. Uh, rivals anything you'll see in a grocery store, and it's right there on the street corner available to the folks that don't have access to those fresh uh, fruits and vegetables and produce. So uh, we're in the community. We're a part of that. Uh, you know, uh, I think back in my time, uh, and uh, as, as it has changed, it's created great opportunity. How agriculture has changed. It's our objective at, from the very early part of our agency has been to treat each acre on an individual farm, on an individual rate, within its needs and capabilities including the, the, the landowner or the producer's goals and objectives. As we move to precision agriculture, we're seeing a greater ability to actually do that. 
I'll share with you real quickly about a farmer that's a friend of mine. Ten years ago in the state of Louisiana, I went out on his operation. He had embraced uh, geospatial technologies, precision agriculture, had a cotton stripper uh, on his farm. The GPS unit had gone out. His yield monitor was not working like it was supposed to be. It was parked there. His father-in-law, who was he was renting and operating on his place, could not conceive he had a cotton crop to get out of the field but would not take that working piece of equipment, except for a yield monitor, would not take it to the field and get that crop out. And he said, you have to understand that if I put that piece of equipment in the field without the data it's gonna to return to me, I have lost my year's work in understanding what's going on on my farm. He was able, because of the data he was given through this precision agriculture technology, he was able to identify the places on his farm that were not productive that he was putting more resources in than it was returning to him in terms of profit. He was able to make those changes, and they are now through use of our programs. He used the Conservation Reserve Program for some buffers. He used the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, uh, even the Wetland Reserve Program, and he was able to take those marginally productive areas that were really costing him money and take them and put them into a conservation use. So we have those kinds of success stories all the way across the landscape and things that we're encouraging with the program that y'all have provided us the resource to deal with. As these things have changed, y'all, as agriculture's changed, as the Farm Bill has drawn us to a greater uh, investment and a greater and a broader mission as an agency. If you go back to the 85 Farm Bill, the first one that had the conservation title in it, it was about soil erosion and wetland conservation. That was it. That was really the focus. And you look at every successive Farm Bill since, y'all have challenged us to work with producers in a broader landscape, to expand our work, uh, to look at water quality, wildlife habitat, uh, uh, grazing land resources, all those kind of things. And, and I will say this, when you go back to the farm, to the dirty 30s, the Dust Bowl to today, I would say the American agriculture producer has a great story. We are sustainable. We, we have, we produce more food on less cultivated acres than we did back in history. Uh, we are removing streams from the 303D list, water quality impaired streams. We're removing those from the 303D list. We have, through the Farmville Conservation Programs and the private landowners utilizing our programs, delisted the black bear, the smell, that several different species, and there's what, 12 other species, Jason? This, he, you know, he, he envisioned the working lands for wildlife. We put that wheels to that thing, and we have probably 12 other species that are probably not on the, actually more, but I'm comfortable with 12, that are not on the endangered species list because of engagement with the private landowners using these conservation programs. We have a tremendous success story. It's all driven by locally led conservation, not making decisions here, having these resources, moving them out as y'all have given them to us to the local level, because the things that are going on in Maine are different than the things going on in Georgia. The needs of those producers are different. The crops, the climate variability, uh, the plains. I was raised in Oklahoma. I'm the plain state of Nebraska. I'm very familiar with living out in that kind of an environment very different. We need to have our conservation programs locally driven. So I will just close real quick. Uh, we have a lot of work going on, uh, the climate hub space. Uh, we're using the, those are just tremendous, uh, 10 of those around the country, we're using those to assess our natural resource conditions, what's going on in these events like this, so that we can make adjustments as we have through history of our programs to be better and more effective with the agriculture producer to promote resiliency, to mitigate drought, do those kinds of things. I'll leave you with this closing remark, and I wanna take you back in time as I was preparing for this uh, as a um, young man in the future farmers of America, I remember a, a, a quote, and it just rings real true to me. It's from William Jennings Bryan. It says, the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms, and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But you destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets in every city in the country. And I believe that is true. I believe the working relationship we have with agriculture, I believe we are sustainable. I think it's this partnership of the federal investment with the private sector 
uh, through the programs that you've authorized us to do that we can have a stronger, more resilient and sustainable agriculture years into the future so that our children have the, enjoy the blessings that we have today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At this point, uh, let me uh, uh, recognize Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, we deferred his uh, opening statement uh, earlier. And Mr. Fortenberry, would you like to uh, uh, make an opening statement? And if so, I recognize you for that purpose. Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for recognizing me. I apologize for my tardiness. If you knew where I was, though, I think you would be um, happy by the distraction. It was at a, a, a meeting on conservation. Um, let, me, let me just truncate my opening remarks. <clears throat> I want to tell you all three things. Conservation is development. Sustainability is good business. And stewardship is a noble value. And what we have in our society, what we have in our economy, what we have in our agricultural policies is an alignment of these three variables that sustainability can be good business when thoughtfully developed in harmony with other needed outcomes of the economy, that the value of stewardship is something that unites and does not divide, and that all of this can actually be a new way to think of, term, of the term development. It's not just building more and more, it's using what you have in a responsible manner which actually creates the opportunity for enhanced income, well-being, and longevity of the very uh, practice, whether it be a farm or a business. And so this is a very important discussion. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a bit of an aside, uh, several years ago, I undertook a project. It's a little bit remote from the considerations here, but it's related to this idea of stewardship. Um, I, I, my, it got hot in Nebraska, and I turned the air conditioner on, and um, it didn't work. So I called the repairman after I did what I could do in lay terms. And he opened it up, and um, there was a mouse that had gotten in there and chewed the wires. So he replaced the capacitor, turned it back on, and it, it started to smoke, the capacitor, not the mouse. <laughs> and he said, Jeff, just sorry, it's, it's done. So OK. That's a $3,000. I started to think through this. I'm highly interested in the whole concept of distributed energy generation, which is a component, an emerging field, actually, in agricultural production. And so I began to look at the financial dynamics of installing a geothermal system. And it's, it's complicated. But after having worked with the HVAC company, having used the federal tax credit, having leveraged the energy loan program in my own state, having gotten a rebate back from the manufacturer, and having gotten a certain subsidy from my own utility, the financial package made enough sense for me to tip that balance. I wanted to do it anyway because of the example it sets of moving toward a more sustainable future, energy future. But we went ahead and did it. Now, the payout is a bit longer than I, I perhaps would have liked, but nonetheless, I'll probably get 20 years of cost-free energy from, from that once the initial uh, capital is, is paid off. Again, there are barriers to entry here, but if we can overcome them through smart public policy and certain subsidies when necessary where there is not a market dynamic that can sustain this, but the larger externality costs certainly justify it, where there are young new generations of, of of people who are actually expanding the agricultural family. I come from production ag state, and that's the backbone of who we are. We help feed America and feed the world, and we're very proud of that. There's a lot of young people who may never have access to a thousand acre grain production facility because they just don't have the land or the capital, but they're starting to do niche markets, organic farming, farm to table, participating in farmers markets, being employed elsewhere, but doing this on the side. This is, a, this is exciting news, and the Department of Agriculture's program, or the agricultural programs at the University of Nebraska are growing, because there is a convergence of fields, conservation, 
international development, environmental security and stewardship programs, along with traditional agronomy and and uh, animal husbandry and other, other programming elements. So I think this is actually a very exciting time to discuss all of these things, Mr. Chairman. And I really wish we could get beyond getting into political lanes when we are confronted with the hard, hard realities of e extreme weather events and the reasons for those, and actually look toward the solutions that move us toward a sustainable energy future that reduces our over-dependence on hydrocarbons to run our economy and looks for the harmonious balance of sustainable development that you talked about, Jason. By the way, Derek Kilmer, Congressman Kilmer from Washington, from Washington State, I think could be your brother. You look very, very much alike. Yeah. But is, do, do you agree with that? Does the panel agree? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry I'm to divert like that, but I'm, I'm looking at you and thinking that at the same time. Yes. <laughs> So actually, uh, instead of all of what we're talking to be about being somehow uh, 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 reasons for divisiveness, is actually reasons for consensus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, votes have been called, and we'll try to move through this as quickly as we can, and we'll reduce the normal uh, questioning time from five minutes to three per minute. Uh, let me start off. Uh, uh, both Mr. Fortenberry and I have both had some unfortunate recent experience with natural disasters in our districts. In my case, it was Hurricane Michael, and in his case, it's the devastating floods that washed through much of the Midwest a few weeks ago. And obviously, we can't stop Mother Nature, uh, but we can mitigate the devastation that, that she wreaks, uh, at least to some extent. Uh, would each of you uh, care to discuss how you think sustainable practices can contribute to farmers' and communities' abilities to withstand natural disasters and about the back. I'll weigh in here uh, real quick. Uh, the, you know, whenever you look at this idea, of you, you, you can't stop a natural disaster, and it, and it is going to have impacts. I actually have, uh, from a, a farmer in uh, Nebraska that is very much engaged in the cover crop effort, uh, and he showed me pictures. He was the flood engaged his property, and the damage that he had is not near as visible as other properties that were not using cover crops, uh, those kinds of things. So, uh, the, you know, you can do the best you can, be as healthy as you can, and then whenever the, the illnesses, the storms hit you, uh, hopefully you aren't hit as hard and you're more resilient and able to respond back. Uh, certainly, y'all have given us some tools uh, through the appropriations and programs. Uh, we've used uh, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program to go back in and repair uh, work that we had done on farms uh, back through history. Uh, there's the emergency conservation program that also uh, provides resources to do uh, do that work, and then we're there with the communities. Uh, in your state specifically, uh, irrigation systems that we would put in place, uh, we're back in there cleaning them off, uh, repairing them, and, and uh, reestablishing irrigation, which is critical to some of the crops that are produced in, uh, in Georgia. So we engage, move in. As was said, we're right there in the community. We move in very quickly and start trying to work to help well, producers. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I still have goosebumps from Mr. Fortenberry's opening remarks. Uh, really passionate, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the, your uh, illustrative and insightful comments. Um, to real quick, uh, what we're trying to do through our system is really help our producers best manage their soils. And Kevin talked about that, uh, Nate has talked about that as well. And that soil management is really the foundation of our food system. It's, it not only feeds us, but it's how you care for that most valuable asset of the farmer is really will help farmers withstand strong storm events, variable weathers, drought and flood. And so it's really then working through our cooperative system, helping farmers identify the right mix of practices on their farms and in their fields to help improve uh, the soil carbon, the soil organic content, the structure, the really the, the physical, chemical and biological properties of the soil system will help it better withstand extreme weather. Al Palm. Thank you. Um, we have to both be resilient in our environmental practices, but also uh, for the economic reality of the farm. And so 
when we have markets that reward uh, farmers for their uh, ecological stewardship, we also have the ability to have more resilient farms from a business point of view. Organic farms are 35% more profitable than the average farm. And so when you hit weather events, which are going to be inevitable, we, uh, the ability to bounce back from that setback is, um, is a difference between a community closing shop and people leaving and being able to recover after a natural disaster. Thank you. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Chairman, since I uh, gave a, a longer opening speech, why don't I defer to the rest of the panel who may have questions before we have to vote and just yield back? Thank you. Ms. Pingree? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I have to say, this, this kind of made my week, and it's a short week, but um, I'm so grateful to the Chair for having this hearing, which I think is a Im really important topic for all of us. I'm thrilled to listen to the ranking member talk about his uh, renewable energy system and how he put all that together, so that's critically important. And yesterday we had Secretary Purdue in here and we got a chance to talk to him a little bit about the positive side of what agriculture can do uh, with carbon sequestration and um, opening up carbon markets to farmers and how we're gonna go about doing that. So to me, it's a big week, I can go home now. Actually, we are going home, so it works out. Um, but um, I don't have a lot of time to ask questions, but I'd be interested, um, Mr. Norton, to hear a little bit more about this, uh, the process of how we use some of these wonderful conservation practices that we already have and um, better quantify what's going on in the soil so that farmers can take advantage of, of potential carbon markets out there. I get really frustrated in this wonderful debate we're having about climate change and it's incredibly important that we do tackle this, but so often people's understanding doesn't go beyond planting a tree. And while I come from a forested state, we love trees. Um, I also wanna understand this topic we've been discussing a little bit today, recognizing that farmers play this amazing role in sequestering carbon in the soil, but we have to have good conservation practices. And then more importantly, um, we have to be able to measure that and be able to have that sustainable in a market. And I know that's something um, that best rests at, um, at the Conservation Service. And so can you talk a little bit about where you are with that and how you see us moving forward? Certainly. Uh, it, so number one is we do have a tool called the Comet uh, tool that actually does give producers the opportunity to quantify, look at their operation and start quantifying uh, the, the services, the carbon uh, things they're sequestering. So we have that going on. Uh, beginning in 2011, uh, we started a process through our conservation innovation grants of going out uh, to private sector, to research entities, to nonprofits and helping build that science behind uh, the carbon sequestration, we rely heavily on the Agriculture Research Service and our land-grant universities to also fill that space. We're making headway. Uh, we're having conversations today with uh, organizations around the soil health and how the, we can quantify the buildup of carbon in those soils so that farmers can begin to communicate, uh, potentially access markets, and make exchanges on those benefits. So we're working in that space. Uh, I'm going to quickly cut you off because I'm going to run out of time and I want everyone else to have a chance. Uh, Jason, do you want to comment at all? And Nate, I'll follow up with you after the committee so I can ask more questions. But are farmers using these tools? They are, and so this is in part through Land O'Lakes. We've made an investment through Land O'Lakes Sustain to build that kind of technology that leverages the public data that USDA has created and many of the tools that Kevin just talked about and puts it into a platform where then one of our sales agronomists from one of our co-ops can go out and work with a producer like, like Nate and not just understand the, the, the flux and the complexity, but actually visualize where in their field they're gaining carbon, where they're losing carbon, where erosion's occurring, and how then to mix and, and target the right conservation system on that field to reduce the loss of carbon, if not increase the adoption of carbon right. in the soils. And again, I will follow up. Th thank you for your wonderful testimony, Nate. I'll yield back. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good to see you, uh, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, thank you for being here. It's always good to have someone from Minnesota here. And to Mr. Paul Plam, I spent, having spent so much time at the Richland County Fair as a youth, congratulations on, on your 4-H win. I'm going to uh, focus a little more on climate uh, change. Um, this is a, a copy of a map that the Star Tribune published um, working with the University of Minnesota Center for Forest Ecology. Scientists looked at three scenarios, one with a major uh, decrease of CO2 emissions, one with a minor decrease, one with no decrease. Under the scenario where there's no, de uh, no decrease in CO2 emissions, scientists estimate by 20 uh, 70, most of Minnesota's boreal forest will disappear and our state's ecosystem would resemble that of Kansas. No offense to Kansas, but we like our trees in Minnesota. 
being the land of 10,000 lakes. So producers are already facing climate change, and you gentlemen know that well, whether it's stream weather or um, you know, uh, d disasters uh, caused by weather uh, that, that is so extreme. So could you, um, maybe I'll, I'll address a question, both questions at the same time. Mr. Weller, can you talk maybe a little bit about what Land O'Lakes Sustain's doing to help with the adaptation to climate change? And Mr. Paul Palm, um, any recommendations for this subcommittee? I know your generation's very concerned about climate change, what we can do to help producers like yourself um, uh, make, make the adjustments. Thank you. So it starts first with building the capacity for our agronomists in the field. These agronomists work through local farmer co-ops and ag retailers. Every day they're out working with growers to identify the right agronomy and, and system of practices on their fields that are ultimately help them be most profitable and productive. But what we're now weaving into this, this agronomy conversation is now a sustainability stewardship conversation. And so for us, addressing extreme weather and a changing climate is about what is the right mix of soil management and nutrient management practices that will help that, that farm be profitable and be more resilient, but also reduce the loss of soil carbon and noxious oxides into the atmosphere. So that's something we start with the farmer to help them um, achieve what's most profitable and effective for that farm. And then through our system, we're linking those farmers back downstream with food companies. So we have food company partnerships like with Campbell Soup Company and with Tate and Lyle, which is an ingredient manufacturer company, who are very interested in climate change. And so now we're creating a farm to fork I, system. I see the clock running, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up more back home. Absolutely, okay. Okay, thank Mr. you. Paul. Thank you so much for the question. A, uh, a recent study came out showing that certified organic farms are sequester 26% more carbon than a regular conventional farm. And so why that is um, so impactful is that we, and not to, I realize I'll follow it with uh, uh, Representative Pingree, but okay, the, um, that we need a market in uh, adoption of, of processes and technology needs a market incentive. Consumers want to purchase certified organic food, and so through that market, we are able to monetize those practices and reward producers for those practices. And so by fully funding the National Organic Program and making sure that we're trying to pursue as much as we can um, the support of those programs that have already been proven out to have a market, um, a market uh, possibility, um, then we're able to see a lot more quickly adopted practices. Mr. Laura. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, Mr. Weller uh, looks like Mr. Kilmer, but I feel very proprietary toward Mr. Weller. Mm -hmm. He served uh, as a staff uh, with this subcommittee for many, many years, including when I was chair. And uh, what a delight to see you on this side of the table, Jason. It's really great. Uh, let me just see if I can three minutes and get m most of this in. Um, NRCS, a budget request, uh, a, a cuts, $40 million cut from the Agriculture Conservation Easement Program, elimination of the Conservation Stewardess Program. House Farm Bill also pr uh, proposed eliminating CSP. Uh, that was rejected, I might add, on a bipartisan basis. So to you, uh, Mr. Norton, um, I, look, I, you're not here to, to, to defend you know, what you're doing about the budget, but could you shed light on what impacts would be if we allowed these cuts, other cuts, to conservation to be enacted? Let me also say there's a $16 million cut uh, to sustainable uh, agriculture uh, in the budget. I don't know how that, what are the negative uh, uh, efforts of that. Uh, to Mr. Uh, Paul Palm, um, you, we have the withdrawal of rules related to organic animal welfare standards. Um, tell me about the rollbacks there and the impact on organic farmers. So let's go. Mr. Norton, where, where do we go um, on uh, the budget? What impacts? So uh, certainly it's a, it's a process and, and that's, uh, that's how this is moving forward. Uh, we'll do with the resources that y'all give us, we're going to do the best we can to be as effective with those resources. I understand. Are you going to just, just tell me if you can do, uh, if you're of the view you can do more with less? I, I got a yes or no here because <laughs> my time is running. So, no, we can't do that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me ask you, Mr. Weller, about uh, uh, the cut to sustainable agriculture. 
So we're working very hard to build upon public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. and we are working very hard then to link our farmers and our local cooperative system with NRCS at the state mm -hmm. and local level. And so cuts in the NRCS capacity on the ground, the professionals that work in the field, but also the programs they deliver, mm -hmm. if they are cut or reduced, that absolutely impacts the ability for what our farmers to do, do what's for needed. Sustainability, thank you. And yes, on the organic uh, farmers and the trust in the public and organic farming. Absolutely, so the organic livestock and poultry practices rule, which was um, mm -hmm. not finalized, is a critical component of moving our industry forward. The, um, as I said in my opening statements, Organic farmers want to be regulated because we have a relationship with consumer trust, and as we are continuously moving towards continuous improvement, we're hoping that we can um, see OLPP come to fruition and actually be finalized because the consumer expects it of us, and it makes sure that we have um, uh, consistency in the rulemaking process. Okay, so we should be moving in that direction. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we've best. pressed for time and I apologize, but I'm so happy that our witnesses were here. I think this has been very, very helpful. So Mr. Wellham, Mr. Norton, Mr. Powell Palm, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate your taking uh, time to come out and share with us your knowledge and your experience and to give us your advice and counsel. Uh, from your testimony, I'm excited about the future of farming and I believe that we have the responsibility to protect our planet and the environment, but farming needs to be economically viable in order to keep uh, our farmers like Mr. Powell Palm, uh, the people Land of Lakes represents, and the people USDA serves in business. Uh, again, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, with that, the subcommittee will stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I got